really see what they're doing and, and whether they're hitting their goals. We also have a product that I'm really excited about that we created from scratch, uh, which we call the Credit Bills product. It is a, uh, we call it a loan, but it's not really a loan to say a agreed upon savings plan. So the customer comes in and says, I want to save this amount of money every month on a, on a contractual basis if we make an agreement. If the customer makes those payments over the time, whether it's six months or a year, um, we're indifferent because it all goes into the customer's savings account. Um, if they make those payments over time, at the end of that period, they will have one the savings account. Two, we will report this to the credit bureau so that the credit score will have improved we see 40 to 50 point move in credit scores in six months. And three, we will offer them the opportunity to have a credit card secured by that account. Um, and then if they are responsible with that credit card, we will increase the credit limit every year so that it will eventually become an unsecured card and they will have a savings account. And they can continue to save on this contractual basis as long as they would like. There's no limit. And we start, I mean, you can start with $25 a month for six months. Um, it, is, it is something that we've designed specifically to help people who were having trouble saving or who had, who had lost their way and wanted to get back on track. We've seen a lot of success. Uh, people are coming into our branch to sign up. People are signing up online. Uh, it is a, it's a product that we think is, is, is really helpful. Um, and we've seen some good traction. Now, like I said, credit scores have improved. And so, so I know I'm not supposed to say this to uh, uh, Reverend Stewart's told me, don't, don't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. All, all debt is not bad, right? Uh, it's the uncontrolled debt that is the problem, right? If you, if you can use leverage, if you can borrow money so that you are buying the eggs to make the cake, right? So then you're, you're on to something. It's when you're, buying, when you're buying in an uncontrolled way, when you're using credit that you can't afford, or when you're using credit in a way that doesn't lead to your goal, that you're running into trouble. So what we hope people will do, because we are a bank and we need to lend some money too, we hope people will borrow from us in responsible ways to buy houses, to, to get an education, to build their business. What we, so we want to help people move to the place where they can borrow at, at, at a way in which they are in control and at rates they can afford. Thank you, great answer. So this is the last question to the panel, but I'll start with Tiffany. So the Prudential uh, African American Financial Experience Study indicates that engagement with financial professionals is relatively low among African Americans. And the top reason is because we don't feel like we have enough assets to get help from a financial advisor. So I'm going to ask the panel, but as I mentioned, we'll start with Tiffany. What are some of the misconceptions about financial advisors, and how do we dispel those myths? First, I would say that I think that it's not only that we don't have enough money, that's what we're perceiving as being, but also there's a lack of trust. You know, we're a community that has, unfortunately, been taken advantage of over and over and over again. So this is the feedback that I'm getting from the people that I help. And so there's a lack of trust with the financial industry um, because I don't think the financial industry has fully stepped in to meet us where we are. And so that's first and foremost. So one, it starts with education. That as a financial advisor, this is what I tell the financial advisors that I have. I'm a financial educator. So I don't sell all those fancy things that y'all sell. I am fed educated. And so this is what happens. Once I tell my client or someone that I say, you know, I just saw my financial advisor today, and this is what he advised, they automatically ask me, who's your advisor? Would you mind sharing it? Because I built trust with them. So I'm able to transfer that trust to my advisor. So it's not that the African American community, but they don't want to work with advisors. There's just a lack of trust there that has to be built to be on a place of one, understanding, two, education. So when I, it took me two years to find my financial advisor because I was interviewing people over and over because I wanted someone that was excited about doing what they did for a living. You know, I didn't want to it was just a job for you. This is my life. So I named my 80-year-old self, her name is Wanda. Don't ask why. It just seems like Wanda seems like a nice little old lady name. So Wanda, <laughs> Wanda is just like, no, I don't like that one. They don't seem like they're really going to look after us. Or no, you know, we're, we're a community of community. You know, we like to feel that we're looked after. So it took me a long time to find someone who was professional, did a good job. But also, I felt like that I was being looked after, and that's that trust in so, that's what I would suggest, education and trust. And from there, you, know, you can really build a strong, a strong relationship, not just with the individual, because when you help me, I tell hundreds of people, you know, that this is what my advice is going to do. 
and I bet you say that for anyone who helps pastor, especially you find influencers in the community. You help us as friends when he gets on the mic Sunday morning and is excited. My financial advisor told me I'm up 20%. You're going to have a line out the door. So build the trust with influencers and educators. First, I, I don't want to tell anybody about my situation. So, so whatever it is, it is, right? And, and, and so I would say to everybody, you know, it's like going to a doctor with you. you know, I don't want them to know that I'm feeling bad. <laughs> okay, how are you going to get better? So, so we've got to get over that, that the one that says, and, and I like the fact that, that people are putting their numbers up on the wall, because that, that is the beginning you know, of, 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 of sort of healing in some sense. Um, and, then, and the other is, uh, it's a lot of jargon in this, in this business. There's a lot of words that don't make sense, things you don't understand. And I, and I just have to feel the same level of comfort to say, stop. Explain that to me so I can understand. Right? It is still my money. I don't want to understand what you're talking about. Don't talk that fast. Don't double talk. Slow it down. And if you're with somebody who won't slow down, walk out.
pay that. All right, so again, it's text uh, my D3 to 41444. Again, my D3 to 41444, followed by your commitment amount and your initials. We want to keep pushing that tonight, but we want to reach out with all before uh, the evening ends. Is that all right? Hey, is that all right? I'm like, I don't know. We want to make sure we do that because it's going to be a blessing to you. We don't want to be a slave uh, to our financial debt. There's a documentary that I'm very excited about, a D3 documentary. Um, and we're going to show it right now. It's going to be only about 10 minutes. But I really want you to pay attention to it. There are some people who have been blessed by, the pro by this program and by uh, the book uh, that I will Dr. Buffasaurus has written. I don't know about you, but I've read the book and it has really helped me. Uh, if you have a plan to come out of debt, if you work the plan, the plan will work. So right now we're going to show the documentary in about 10 minutes. I want you to pay strict attention to it and I guarantee you it'll be a blessing to you. Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. It's not really money that we love. It's the things that money buys that we love. Advertisers today are teaching us that we will feel better if we look back. Our culture has taught us we need, when in fact we don't need them, we just want them. We fall in love with things. When we run out of money, we don't run out of love for things. So then we use the credit card. Payday lenders charge 700% interest. It eats away at our financial capacity because we want it. We want more than we can afford as quickly as we can get it. Debt is a bigger problem than racism. Being in debt is slavery. When we got out of segregation and physical slavery, there was a financial slavery that made me even deeper than the physical slavery we were in. This onslaught of easy access to credit, easy access to drugs. We were completely unprepared for society as we inherited it. 54% of African-Americans either have no bank account or they have a bank account and don't use it. The minimum wage for the National Basketball Association is $375,000. Yet 60% of the players are bankers. This is not just a Baptist problem, this is an American problem. When we used to keep up with the Joneses, at least the Joneses were next door. Now the media culture has superimposed on us people that we don't know. But the means of securing that vision is destroying the country. How is it, people, appropriate for you to look out for yourselves, wear designer clothes, keep up with the Kardashians, yet headquarters is in trouble? The reason we tolerate government debt the way we do is because we have our own debt. So if I'm in debt, and you're in debt, and the state's in debt, and the feds in debt, it doesn't even offend us that we owe more money to China. There is a role people must play in their own uplift. You'll have to pass down. It's hard to start from zero to make something yeah. so. That's hard to do. And then you go to the community and you don't need that. No one teaches you. They don't teach you to, uh, to think smarter. They don't, they don't, all you're doing is just working to work. You never 
think of the future, what you need to secure your future. I was a pregnant teenager, wanted to do things that was a pleasure, quick, fast, and in a hurry. I was in debt. Um, you know, I did the credit cards. As soon as I turned 18, they started, applications started coming in, I filled them all out. I didn't think anything was wrong with that because everyone around me did it. That's what made me go, let me go take this class. Our debt free movement is based on personal responsibility. You want to succeed, you want to do what you have to do to succeed. I had to make this place successful in order for me to be successful. It's a 12 step process um, with a book and a workbook that essentially walks you through the lifestyle change. At one point, I had maybe 20 to 30 pairs of sneakers. You know, one, one pair for each, each day of the month. My son needed every pair of Jordans that came out every week. He needed to go to every, every 25. You know, children in his class birthday party, they, they had to have the most expensive gift. I felt like he needed those things, so he didn't feel intimate. And that's where the whole D-free construct comes from. It's really addressing the psychological, spiritual, mental, and emotional aspects of the way we handle our money. And so we challenge people, listen, do you really need 800 TV stations? Or can you get by with basic cable? Do you really need to get your nails done twice a month? Maybe you can get them done once a month. It's not to break people down, it's to bring people into a state of reality. I may not be to the point where I'm filing bankruptcy, or the IRS is after me, or, you know, I don't I have a home for it to go into foreclosure, but these credit cards and student loans and, and medical bills, that, that debt, not only was it simple that I understood that I had the problem, but he also made it simple that I can get out of it. And what D3 does is it gives you the power to fix it, because you no longer feel like a victim of your financial situation. It's definitely a, a mentality, um, more so than just a piece of paper and writing out numbers and crossing off things off the list. Your, your mindset really has to change. If you allow how you were raised to dictate where you're going, you'll forever stay in bondage. But you know inside yourself who you are, who you believe that you are, who your family and trust you to be. You can't talk strategy until your behavior changes. Our behavior flows from our belief. And thus, we, we teach a belief system that's anchored in certain principles. Principles of morality, principles of virtue, principles of thrift. Then taking what our behaviors look like and applying it to practical financial principles. So you're eliminating debt, you're paying your bills on time, and then taking those savings and transitioning it so that you can start building a future. We set aside a day on our honeymoon that we're married for three days and we're on our honeymoon with Barbados. I could have killed <laughs> But we create our family budget, our three month goals, and also five or six year plans. I want to be able to have something for them. Brandon, right, just a barbershop. This is the room. This is everything to me. Then there was one week at the, in the D Free workshop where Pastor told us to write down our different passions. And one of the things I wrote was children. So maybe I can just start doing my own daycare. It's not that I'm making so much more money and that I'm rich, but I don't owe anybody money. I feel empowered just to see my credit score go up. You know, that, that right there is power. There are four levels of financial freedom. Level one is get started, write down what you spend. Level two, get control. Have a budget, have a plan, don't just spend it cost. Level three is get ahead, save for a rainy day. But level four is get back. That financial freedom based on strong ethics, based on biblical principles, based on black culture. Freedom is helping someone else become free.
But if you celebrate your options, then you see your life as a sequence of opportunities. Our job is to convince people to pursue the opportunities and thus overcome the restrictions. The first program we put together in 2005, we had maybe 10 people there. And now, and we have a free conference, and you have thousands of individuals there. It got to the heart of the problem. Because you can get out of debt, but if your mind is not transformed, then you want to get right back into debt. I told God, he's been so good to me. If, if I was to really break down everything I've been through, I feel so good. And it's the least I can do by giving back to him. People can see that it can be done. I am this new club. I am here for the people. That's civil society. That's the community. That's what Dr. King would call the beloved community. And without that horizontal relationship, anything vertical from earth to heaven is too individualistic to be a value to anybody other than yourself. You gotta read the book. You gotta do the workbook. Go on the website, find out when there's a, work, a workshop because it's so, he makes it so simple, but it's such a huge impact on your life. Four years ago, at our first African 
African American Financial Experience Survey, we had a, a press conference, and he and I were on a panel together. And he talked about his passion, his ministry around E3. And that really moved me. And that was the beginning of this relationship. And I'll tell you, I have, I've never regretted it. And I see it growing every year, and I'm really thrilled. So it is my pleasure to introduce the architect of D3. The person who got this going, whose ministry has expanded, Reverend Dr. DeForest Soros. Professionals happened to be a male, 
came up to me after we raised that offering, and, and he, he said to me, Reverend, I'm so proud to be a part of a church that responded the way you did. I, I'm so happy that you took responsibility to invite us to give to Katrina. He said, I just wish I had something to give. I, I just didn't have anything to give, and I looked at him. He was wearing a $1,500 suit. <laughs> And on a $300 shirt, $100 tie, $700 shoes, I said, boy, give me your belt. I'll sell that to you. <laughs> and I realized, I realized then that the D3 campaign was absolutely critical at First Baptist because this young man was professional, had a college degree, he was making more money than any member in his family had ever made, but he was broke. He was living the way I had lived when I was very young. I had more money on my back than I had in my bank account. I was looking good on the outside, but I was possessing nothing on the inside. I would say to my father, Dad, listen, can you just lend me some money until next week when I get paid? He'd say, you work every single day. And I'd say, I don't know where my money goes. And he would say, don't leave home while you're sleeping. so typical of why we're here tonight. And 10 years later, we, we are here. Five years we focused on First Baptist exclusively. And then CNN came along, and CNN did a documentary on our work. 14.9 million people saw the documentary. They aired it again in October of 2011. The book came out, Credential came along, and now we are in over 300 churches around the country. We're partnering with six national denominations. And in the fourth quarter this year, we're piloting D3 in Johannesburg, South Africa, in Gabarone, Botswana, Botswana, and Nairobi, Nigeria. In fact, our African coordinator for D3, the whole continent is here tonight, Angela Datsun. Angela, where are you? She is responsible for coordinating all of our African D3. Where is she? There you are, stand up and wave. So, 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 there are four things we are passionate about doing. One is, is making sure we, as a people, actually control how we use the money we have. You know, Jesus said, why would you ask for more if you mess it up with your hand? Why would God trust us with more if he can't trust us with little? And the second thing is, is to not only manage what we have, but to, to use it effectively. To, to use it the way the pastor of Salem Baptist Church in Brooklyn used his money. I preached at the chapel in Shaw University for 12 years. And uh, at the 12th year, I was sitting there waiting to be introduced by the chaplain. And he said the nicest things that he could ever say about somebody, talking about my intelligence, talking about my good looks, talking about my being down to earth, talking about all these things. And at the end of the introduction, I realized he wasn't talking about me. <laughs> he, he said to the students, I'm ready. You know, I'm sitting there trying to look humble, you know. And I, I, I'm ready to stand and thank you for that great introduction. And he said, young people, let me introduce you to Dr. Thomas J. Boyd. <laughs> and I said, Dr. Thomas J. Boyd. Well, the chapel at Shaw University is named for a chapel. And it's named after Dr. Thomas J. Boyd, a retired pastor from Salem Baptist Church. I always thought Dr. Thomas J. Boyd was dead. <laughs> After all, they named stuff after you start, after you die. So now I've got this old 93-year-old preacher that has this great introduction, and I'm trying to figure out why they named the chapel after Dr. Boyd while he's still alive. So we went to lunch, and I asked him, I said, Dr. Boyd, why did they name that chapel after you? He said, well, probably because I gave my half a million dollars to build it. I don't have a half million dollars to give anybody for anything. How'd you do that? He said, every time I did a funeral or a wedding, I got a little extra money for a revival, they'd give 
get the little check, and give me some money, and I never spend the money. Really, I spend my life before I get it. <laughs> Sometimes I go to the priest to get the money because I spend it. So when I took the money, he said, I took the money, I put it in an account, the account got too big, the bank called me and said, listen, we can grow this account. It went from a savings account to an investment account. The investment account got larger than I ever dreamt it would get. He said, and then I went back to my alma mater to visit Shaw University. I was so embarrassed that the chapel was in disrepair. I took out my checkbook and I wrote from that account a check for five hundred thousand dollars. That's how we did it. I came home and set up an account myself. <laughs> because the fact is, it doesn't matter how much we make, but it matters how much we spend. And if we spend more than we make, we are broke. We may be fine, we may be good looking, but we're broke. <laughs> so, so we want to manage what we have, we, we want to get ahead, and, and then we want to protect what we have. That, that, that's why my relationship with Prudential means a lot to me. Look, this is the, the gap between black wealth and white wealth, the median net worth of a black family in this country is about $6,000, medium. 35% of us have negative net worth, but the median. The median net worth of a white family in America is $120,000. That's 20 times more. We are not going to save our way to close that gap. We're not going to work our way to close that gap, and we're certainly not going to win our lottery away to, to close that gap. Only way we're going to close that gap is when we die, leave enough for our children to close the gap for them. And the fact of the matter is, the gap is real. We know why the gap is there, but we can't spend the rest of our lives complaining about slavery and Africa and racism. We know how we got here, but we need to know how to get out of here.
we're going to have conferences and events, but it's going to work church by church. Why the church? One, because the church has the power. So that's the power. Really? 